Today I am going to speak about, as it tells you, what about technology and politics in Japan's contemporary performance culture. So I will mainly read the paper and I try to be as slow as possible because I have a, of course, it's a Japanese English accent. So introduction. I'd like to start my introduction by referring to three axioms with which Gabriela Gianaki begins her recent study on issues of politics of performing technology and performing aesthetics in her book, The Politics of New Media Theater, Life Trademark, uh, published in 2007. And they are Technology is material, literary, and social, and artistic performance impacts on economic performance. And three, uncertainty is at the root of the politics of knowledge. The first comes from a seminar study on a typical modern production formulation of multi-layered knowledge about own technology by Stephen Shaping and Simon Schaefer's The Book, Leviathan and The Air Pump, Hobbes, Boyle, and Experimental Life, uh, published in 1985, in which, referring to Boyle's air pump, the authors demonstrate that there are these, this is the quotation up there, there are three kinds of technologies, a material technology embedded in the construction and operation of the air pump, a literary technology by means of which the phenomena produced by the pump were made known to those who are not direct witnesses, and a social technology that in incorporated the conventions experiment, experiment philosophers should use in dealing with each other and considering knowledge claims. Literary and social practices Shaping and Schaefer demonstrates, as well as machines, are knowledge-producing tool, the end of quote. And those three technologies do not exist or function separately, but, quote again, each of these incorporates the others. This means that technology, culture, and society do not operate separately, but are intrinsically embedded in one another. Technology is not only grounded in materiality, but also in discourse, fiction, and society. The end of quote. This leads Gianaki to the second axiom that, quote, artistic performance impacts on economic performance, the end of quote, because, quote again, by dislodging technology at the material and literary levels, the artists are therefore able to affect technology as a means of social and political interaction, the end of quote. At the same time, such familiar terms as performance, surplus, and spectacle are integral in understanding how it is possible for artists to affect technology or economic performance. As she, Janaki, says, at the level of a spectacle, the world of art and that of economics resolve into one another, causing an excess, capital, or surplus of information. This excess is where art is politically and aesthetically charged, the end of quote. And according to her, quote, process of Weltfremdank defamiliarization, rather than Entfremdank alienation, should be allowed to occur, quote, the dislocative multiple, fragmented, ambivalent, and, and especially uncertain quality of the aesthetics, the end of quote, should continue any interventionist artistic practice, the end of quote. Thus comes her third axiom that, quote, uncertainty is at the root of politics of knowledge, in the end of quote. In the following parts of my paper, my intention is not to interrogate or measure the possibility of applying her three axioms to three specific performance, uh, performances that I'm going to discuss. I will sometimes come back to those whenever it's necessary, but it is basically rather to ask you to keep those three axioms in mind as a shared theoretical assumption. 
especially because when I use the word technology, I am using it in the sense that Yanaki does when explicating her three axioms. The next section that is titled Marking the Moment of the End of, end of Humanism, Dam type in the early 1990s. The Jap history of Japan's modern theater, especially after the 1960s, was that of following footsteps of Yeji Godowski's Poor Theater and or Peter Brook's Empty Space. In accordance with one of the major principles of the modernist aesthetics, that can be formulated as basically a formal redefinition of the genre itself, actor's body was centralized, often privileged as a major source of theatrical communication, both theoretically and practically. As Brooke famously declared in 1968, I can take any empty space and call it a bare stage. A man, that's a sick, walks across this empty space while someone else is watching him. And this is all that is needed for an act of theater to be engaged, the end of quote. In this sense, actor's body is the central medium in theatrical communication. And at least during what I consider Japan's modernist era, after the period of modernizing theater practices, before and after World War II, of Shingeki, a uh, new theater, uh, the uh, model after the, the modern Western dialogue-based theater, in theater history between the late 1960s and the entire 1970s, the quote, the actor's body was the message, the end of quote, to rephrase Marshall McLuhan's famous phrase. Technology, or more precisely, a vague and dubious popular image of technology, as for instance, machines in general, was therefore eagerly displaced from those little theater spaces of Kalajuro's Red Tent or Suzuki Tadashi's Waseda Shogekijo, uh, Waseda Little Theater. In a small space inside the tent or the tiny second floor of a coffee shop in Waseda, actors somewhat inevitably had to physically confront and interact with the audience at a very close range. For this kind of performance, they only needed a very basic technology of lighting and sound, nothing else. We can, of course, argue it was simply because they could not afford to purchase high-tech equipment of the day, just as some of them went underground, because underground spaces were so readily available during the time of high economic growth in the metropolis of Tokyo either for a theoretical choice or for a simple financial reason, or both, underground theater practitioners set the path for the major portion of Little Theater's underground theater, it's called Angura Theater in Japanese, till the early 1980s, then given a more general title of Little Theater, positioning towards technology. Technology can be a tool, but the centralized means of communication is actor's body that speaks given and or improvised words. That's when video technology became financially affordable for many of us during the 1980s. Most practitioners only thought of it as a recording device for the live performance. Liveness, therefore, as elsewhere, was taken for granted as an in intrinsic and privileged property of theater performance, thereby consciously or unconsciously taking live performance up against many forms of technology, which was supposed to decrease the value of liveness of theater, as they tend to value the notion of immediacy as against that of mediacy, which technology seems to force us to engage with. The naive faith in liveness and immediacy of theater continues even today as we will see in the later part of this paper. I am not, however, briefly, exp I, uh, briefly explaining still prevailing essentialist notion of liveness to critique Japan's contemporary theater culture, but to give you a sense of the degree of impact when Dam Type, uh, the theater or artist, artist collective, came into the scene towards the end of the 1980s. 
within so uh, drastic or even revolutionary change in their work in terms of their ideological and theoretical attitudes toward technology. To put it very simply, they were not afraid of technology in the sense of common, largely ungrounded belief that technology is dehumanizing and maybe threatening the very existence, the, the very nature of humans. They embrace technology as part of their living environment, realistically and virtually, which gesture, of course, is not surprising if located in the field of visual art, in which some members of dumb type had originally been trained. But it was refreshingly new, refreshingly new to some of us working mainly in theater. In PH, uh, between, it was made, it was a, uh, the work in progress for uh, a certain amount of time, so the, the, the year of creation is usually referred to as 1990 to 1993. Uh, Dam Tai problematized and performed the issue of technology in ways that we had never witnessed before. According to their website, PH was Dam Tai's largest scale work to date, integrating performance, installation, video, and printed material. The audience seats lined up above both sides of the slender 60 meter, while uh, 16 meter white linoleum room floor. On the stage, a horizontal bar moved across the floor, suggesting a giant photo photocopy machines. Installed on the bottom surface of the bar were a number of slide projectors, which projected images on the floor where performers, human beings, acted and danced under the mercy of and or against the machine society. I'm just gonna show you the clip of that. Probably you could get a sense of it that uh, not down, not notice Dam Type's awareness of the relationship between what they call performers, uh, for emphasis, human beings, and the machine. In the terminology, the latter is loosely related to the notion of, of, of technology. What is performed here is exactly that. As the above statement, this statement makes clear how humans are literally and performatively be, quote, under the mercy of and or against the machine, the end of quote. During the performance, the human beings demonstrate and establish different kinds of relationship 
with the technologically controlled, volatile environment that surrounds them. They are sometimes threatened by the materiality of the technology, while at other times they flirt and play with the effects that the technology enables them to produce. Especially noteworthy here is their use of stage machinery for lighting effects and their frequent use of stage space, including the stage floor and back wall as a physically limiting and threatening, yet usable and aesthetically translatable entities. In this sense, the dematerialty of technology sometimes becomes the material tool at hand to generate aesthetic images. Here is an apt and aestheticized image of human-machine interaction at the time when the notion of what they call human beings was still intact, though gradually being threatened, therefore considered worth performing. To put it more bluntly, as it stated before, dumb type is not afraid of technology. Rather, they are simply enjoying the availability of high-tech equipment of the day. This, remember, this is 20 years ago. While in their frame of mind, a literal and traditional concept of human body in the context of even advancing technology, not post-human body, a theoretical construct that was to be popularized later, was a critical issue. I would like to characterize the work, therefore, after this was in the paper, not I'm saying it because Richard's here, but Richard Schechner as epitomizing the moment of the end of humanism. If we go back to Janaki, dumb type at this stage are more interested in the notion of alienation rather than defamiliarization with regard to human machine interface. Therefore, a sense of uncertainty was not necessarily foregrounded in the performative documentation of human machine possible and or impossible interaction. Section two, control or else, Hirata Oriza's Robot Theater. While dumb type was starting to enjoy and problematize available technology, Hirata Oriza, born in 1962, a playwright and director, was attempting to renew the sense of little theater with his quiet theater practices. In terms of the use of technology, however, Hirata was more drastic as he got rid of most of stage machinery. In his contemporary colloquial theater, only a minimum amount of lighting effects is allowed and he almost never uses sound effects. His is a faithful reproduction of every, everyday life, allegedly at that, of course, and the continuation of everyday life ness of the outside world to the stage is crucial for his aesthetics. He claims that faithfully, he faithfully reproduces how people speak Japanese language in their daily lives. Therefore, dramatic effects at the level of language and or at the level of technological effects usually had to be almost salary dispensed with. We must be reminded, however, his version of faithful realism is not an exact duplicate of psychological realism in Western modern theater emerged during the 19th century in continental Europe. For one, as is well known, he is not interested in psychological aspects of characters who are supposed to interact with each other to unfold a psychologically motivated causalistic chains of events that is to occur in a linear time. At the level of the characters, they of course are given their own inner traits and psychology. But Hirata does not expect the actors to create and or enact their role from their, this perspective. In many occasions, he has commented that he is not interested in actor's art, and his stage directions famously consist of drastically mathematical specifications like pose for five seconds count 10 before you speak this line, or walk five steps towards the front and stop. There is no emotional specificity usually given in nearest dramatic texts such as angrily or with fervent joy or what have you. 
His dramatic words, in other words, is complete at the level of the text, or more precisely, at the level of the computer screen. Actors are there only to faithfully reproduce their meticulously constructed dialogues, gestures, and movements the author has previously imagined in his head at the time of writing with his computer. In theater, theater, actors, therefore, are always in necessarily replaceable parts of the entire performance, at least in theory. This issue is related to often obscured ideology of Hirata, in which he seems to stick to the notion of the homogeneity of the Japanese nation. The Japanese for Hirata look, behave, act almost in the same way. Therefore, they are replaceable. Actors for him are robots for enacting what is written by him with language. If so, yes, you guessed it, by a simple extension of the logic Robots can play his characters. In this vein, indeed, it is not at all surprising Hirata introduced Robots as a cast member of his more recent works. The first occasion was in October 2008 with I, a worker, Hataraku Watashi in Japanese, at Osaka University, where Hirata is a pr pr professor and the robot scientist Ishiguro Hiroshi teaches. The performance is reportedly lasted only 20 minutes long, as there were still many technological difficulties to adjust for such an experiment. The next occasion came with a full-length performance, almost 90 minutes long, of In the Depth of Forest, Morino Oku in Japanese, which had a formal premise, premiere during the Aichi Triennale in August to, uh, uh, 2010. The play, actually, is a rewrite of Hirata's older play called Monkeys at the Northern Limit, Hokugen no Saru, written in 1989, in which a science lab con uh, conducting research on apes in northern Japan was the place of dramatic action. For an updated version of the play, renamed as In the Depth of the Forest, location is now Congo in Central Africa, and the time is near future. This is a research lab for bonobo or pig, pygmy chimpanzees, a uh, pygmy chimpanzee, an anthropoid, which is often said to be the closest to human species. According to the homepage of the Triennial, here's a quote, the play takes place, as I said, in the research lab in Congo, Central Africa, where they breed bonobos, an anthropoid, which inhabit the region. Robots and humans do research on the difference between apes and humans among their conver uh, conversation, blurred borderlines between apes, humans, and robot, uh, robots would emerge. On stage, robots and humans act, converse, and interact very naturally. This unprecedented performance expresses how robots and humans will be in the near future, and the audience are not expected to be intellectually impressed, but to be emotionally moved. The process of rehearsing and performing the work will be fed back to the field of robotics, and the performance itself becomes an advanced experiment closing theater and science, the end of quote. Robots used here are called wakamaru, designed by Professor Ishiguro and manufactured as it's, it is called communication robots, by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries <coughs> Limited. Wakamatsu is already in the market, and you can lease it, him, her, if you like, uh, if you like it, and have a considerable amount of money. I'd like to add that Wakamaru, in the performance, two robots actually were used, are uh, meticulously programmed during the rehearsal period, and are controlled by operators during the performance, though some limited degree of uh, autonomy are given to them. She's uh, actually visiting the, uh, the Congo lab and she has a child with autism and she's talking about how the, uh, she doesn't really understand the notion of autism. <clears throat> Here comes another one. They have 
to Robert's assistant in the lab. Autism is, uh, is a mystery, and you really have to open up the brain to understand its symptoms. What is happening? She's asking them to, to use the bonomo and, 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 and uh, artificially making a bonomo uh, uh, the symptoms of the autism. And actually, uh, Hirata-san, Hirata is now uh, using the Android, which Android is actually more uncanny. It looks like more human. And uh, he just did the, uh, the Chekhov's three sisters using the robots and the androids, which I did not see. Uh, but uh, there might be some other interesting things happening there also. That's what I wanted to say here. But anyway, uh, the play basically consists of a series of dialogue between the characters, or more precisely, series of like dia uh, dialogic lectures in disguise of everyday life conversation occurring in a research lab. They touch upon all these supposedly contemporary human issues of violence, sexuality, community, and so on, referring to interesting behaviors and displayed traits of the lab kept vulnerable, covering, though generalistically at that, all areas of ecology, philosophy, or anthropology, ethology, neuroscience, and medicine. It is as if reading through books or journal articles, which belong to the genre of Keimo show in Japanese. Keimo literally means enlightenment, or enlightenment, or education. And Keimo show are those writings for non-professionals, but considered necessary for an educated citizen. It is important to note here that these lectures for amateurs in the play are delivered by a way of conversation or a dialogue. It is not for the audience as if it is not for the audience as if listening to the lecture from a lectern, but it is as if involved in the process of knowledge formation that Hirata wants us to share. Nevertheless, for those more conscious of those issues, as is usually the case with with Hirata's work, there is nothing new. All the knowledge delivered or unveiled in this particular performance, for instance, is basically already acquired a certain degree of journalistic consensus. A bit metaphorically speaking, if you read a newspaper every day, you will not find anything new here. Of course, you could argue nobody reads a newspaper any, every day anymore, and here rests the value of Hirata's educational and entertaining performance. In this performance, robots are made to be a familiar and unthreatening existence. In short, they are the realization of an anthropocentric image of the otherness. They speak, move, respond, and behave in proximity of those of humans, in this particular instance, those of imagined Japanese-ness, even though, or rather precisely because, they have a very robot-like appearances. They do look like, you, you know, you, you might have noticed that, you, you should have noticed that they do look like robots. Of course, they have to look like robots because they are robots. We cannot help noticing the cute quality, as well as a vague implication of Japanese ancientness, witness the name Wakamaru, and its outer shape being close to those of Haniwa. Haniwa is a represented clay figure of the, from the ancient times with supposedly ancient dress of two wakamarus, the robots, which adds the degree of familiarity that characterizes these robots. That is to say, they become commercially more viable products to be sold or rent. Those robots are not performing technology and are not expected to do so. Rather, they are performing ideology of so-called Japan's post-war democracy a perverse and distorted version of Western liberalist humanism, as here is a performance-based, firmly grounded belief system of always already differentiated human autonomy as a species, displaying at the same time a dubious sense of Japanese homogeneous collectivity. Going back to Janaki, uh, the three axioms, that is to say, again, a technology is material, literary, and social, 
Two, artistic performance impacts on economic performance. Three, uncertainty is at the root of politics of knowledge. What can we say about his work? For one, it is important that materiality of technology is thus presented as concrete forms of robots, but its literary and or social implications are not discussed nor problematized in any way in this production. The characters respond to the robots very naturally, as, is, as its ad on the homepage declares, because in the very near future, that is how robots will be incorporated in our lives. As for the axiom two, it aptly applies to Hirata's work, though it impacts the economic performance in an opposite direction from Janaki imagines, as the performance functions as a showcase for commercial product that can be leased or sold. As for the axiom three, we may wonder if robots are controlled and are self-sufficient during the performance, unless we have some background information. But there is nothing uncertain about the performance here. Everything is scripted, programmed, and heavily controlled, as a good theater should be. Because of its almost flawless stability that the technology is performed here, we may detect, to use uh, Bernadetti Wegenstein's uh, 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 a media theorist phrase, a certain degree of our, quote, contemporary obsession with control and the anxiety that results from an, our incapacity to manage our environment, the end of quote. Further, we should call the controlled performance space as obsession or not uh, is, of course, a matter of dispute. As some may argue, this is about aesthetic control, but not about the deep-seated anxiety of the artists concerning the issue of controlling the environment. We cannot help but notice, however, a sheer joy, though somewhat ambivalent, dumb type, uh, dumb type displayed in the PH. After more than 70 years ago, it is replaced by a calm and even serene sense of controlledness in Hirata's work. In a more anecdotal yet not in too insignificant story regarding the work, According to a complex system scientist, AI scientist, Ikigami Takashi, whose work I will discuss in the next section, the only issue with or the only uncertainty about those communication robots are the life of the battery. Ironically enough, in the second performance of In the Depth of Forest, one of the battery unexpectedly died during the performance. La the lesson we have to learn from this performance, therefore, is quite traditionally humanistic. Don't rely on the technology too much. The third section, AI meets performing body externally, Ikegami Takashi's experiment. The last case I'm dealing with today is a very important provocation in that it is a rare case, at least in Japan, of an aesthetic provocation from advanced science research. There are some notable cases in recent times of the collaboration between performing artists and scientists, most understandably between dancers, uh, choreographers, and cognitive scientists, since the notion of embodiment has become a hot scientific and theoretical issue. Unfortunately, scientists in Japan, as far as I know, have shown almost no interest in performing arts and for performing artists, as Hirata's case testifies well, most of them were only interested in more simple and pragmatic aspects of science. It seems both sides tend to play safe as both dare not venture into the unknown. Ikegami Takashi's work, therefore, is quite exceptional as, as a leading complex system scientist, uh, complex system and AI scientist. He sometimes works in the context of visual art and performing arts. I will introduce today his recent work using the Mind Time Machine, MTM. I will quote Ikegami's short, uh, short uh, an introductory essay for conference he attended in length here, so that I don't, this is gonna be a very long quote because I, sometimes I don't understand that, you know, the technical language that he speaks. He attended in length here so that I don't make a mistake in introducing his work and his use of scientific vocabulary. 
It is entitled Self-Organization of Time Space with Mind Time Machine. He sort of declares from the first, it is time for bringing artificial life in silico into the real world. He goes on, different forms of artificially simulated environment, the real world prepares many unexpected encounters of complexities, and living systems are essentially adaptive to the real world complexities. An agent has to deal with various kinds of sensory flows simultaneously, but sustaining its own identity and autonomy on the other. In this paper, as I said, this is the introduction that he presented at the conference. In this paper, we introduce our recent project on making a special machine that self-organizes its own subjective time space in the open environment. We made a machine called MTM, Mind Time Machine, running in the real world all day long without losing its complex dynamics. As the results of this long time sustainability, we argue that the system's own time structure is organized. We presented this MTM for the first time at Yamaguchi Center for the Arts and Media in March 2010. This machine consists of three screens, right and left, and the above, displayed at the corner of a cube skeleton of 15,400 millimeters each side. 15 cameras attached to each pole of the skeleton shoot things happening in the venue. That short image, images are decomposed in flames and the chaotic neural dynamics will control the other macro processes that combine, reverse, and uh, superpose them to make new frames. MTM was presented as the artwork, but at the same time provides a new experimental test bed for studying artificial life in the real world. While demonstrating MTM at the museum, we are taking data from the machine and analyzing them. The operating principle is to composite chaos from a neural dynamics and the optical feedback to make autonomous time organizing phenomena. Intake images from cameras were progressively embedded in the network connections. Visual images are taken in and replayed again and again with recursive modifications. The system itself is a completely deterministic system without using any random numbers. But it shows different images depending on the inherent instabilities, environmental light conditions, movement of people coming to the venue, and the system's stored memory. A momentary now of a system is thus progressively generated by a nested future and past time frames. Well, conceptually, it's understandable. But just to look at it, it it's, it's always the case with this experiment. It's not really that interesting. But if you know the concept, so sometimes people will come in, and these are the responses of the computer, uh, what he calls a neural dynamic system, which is very, very similar, close to the human neural system. It's responsible and is translated into the, all these visual images to whatever, who, whoever is walking into the venue. This is more sort of easy to understand what is going on. He was talking about three size images. that the inputs are not only visual, but also a uh, 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 sound. The second experiment 
with MTM he's now working on took place for its initial stage at Asahi Art Square in Tokyo, July 16, 2010. So this is a little bit more than two years ago. This time's MTM's function, Mind Time Machine function, was narrowed down to generate sound and soundscape. No visual, visual scape, but no visual is produced, but only the sound. For this occasion, he invited three dancers uh, Kamimura Megumi, Tochigi Taiyo, and Neji Pijin to collaborate with the machine slash system. This time it was called Sound MTM, Sound Mind Time Machine, though the basic concept before, uh, behind and mechanism was the same as previous MTM. According to Ikegami, Sound Machine MTM is, here is the quote, this is how it works, real-time recording and replaying sounds happening in a space by MTM. Initially, this is presented at Wycom. And let three dancers move freely in space for 10 minutes, then ask them to leave there. Because of the autonomy of the MTM system, MTM continues generating, replaying, and recording an ever-changing soundscape. Technically speaking, the sound made by dancers are recorded, and MTM replays the sound by the rule based on the visual inputs of the dancer's motion. Initially, short sound files are assigned to each camera. A positive feedback code between a speaker and a microphone should be generally avoided. Here, we use a time, time delay to avoid the diverging oscillation and inversely produced a unique soundscape. This is the end of quote. In other words, everything that happens in the real space of Asahi Art Square, the, 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 the performing space, including dancers' movement and involuntarily or voluntarily generated sounds was translated, as it were, as sound of the MTA machine to work on to keep generating its own ever-changing autonomous soundscape, and that is indefinitely. Again, it's interesting to see how the dancers, they actually, what they did was that, first, they didn't tell the dancers what the rules are, <laughs> and the dancers were first just, you know, uh, moving around and see what happens, if, you know, what kind of movements they make, and what kind of sound comes out of it. And the second experiment was they are allowed to use their voices too, uh, because this is the sound machine. And again, they are seen, you know, they were asked to do whatever they want to do, and they were interacting with each other, and they are thinking, listening very carefully what is coming out of, uh, uh, of all the speakers uh, after uh, being put through the system that Ikigami has created. And the third performance is more in a very sort of, they can do whatever they want. So now this is the last stage.
Okay. So you are not supposed to be looking too much. I mean, you have to be listening to the soundscape. And the, the third guy actually is trying to go out of the camera because the, all the visual images are translated through this system into the, the, the sound. Okay, so at the moment, uh, Ikegami, the, uh, the scientist's aim is very specific. As is quoted earlier, it is to generate a momentary now of a system, progressively generated by a nested future and uh, past time frames. Then the question becomes, how can or should artists respond either to the concept or the materiality of what Ikigami calls a momentary now of a system. At the beginning of the experiment, the three participating dancers were not sure what to do. But as the experiment went on, they seemed to, be, they seemed to intuitively understand the nature of interactiveness of the sound space, soundscape, and their movement, gestures, poses, and voice, although the system being very complex, there was no seemingly direct response of the machine, for instance, to whatever movement they make. After they are familiarized with the space, they seem to start enjoying simply being there, moving within its ever-changing soundscape. In conclusion, I am not, of course, in the position to evaluate Ikegami's experiment in the context of scientific research. But in the context of this paper, this positive approach from scientific research may open up a possibility of a new kind of collaboration between two fields, that of performing arts and that of science. Not only that, in Ikegami's thinking, human mind consciousness and the MTM share a very similar kind of system in terms of its time organizing principle. What does and can this mean? In Ikigami's experiment, technology itself is no longer an issue. He's asking what one of the most advanced forms of technology can offer to performing arts. The machine, in this case, the entire system, is heavily controlled. But, not unlike, but unlike Hirata's notion of controlling the performance space, the system is controlled so that what comes out of it Further ever changing visual image of TMT or soundscape by sound TMT is not. As long as you provide electricity, it goes on and on, a moment, momentary now of a system, progressively generated by a nested future and past time frames, will keep emerging. Does this machine system actually change the way? Dancers make their dance at a momentary now of a system? If so, how? Do we have a way of verbally describing that change? Or are we expecting to see some kind of aesthetic breakthrough that the technology can bring into the visual art and or the dance? Or all these are only speculative and conceptual and the end product of performance may not necessarily look too different as this experiment can be understood as a long-standing, mainly modernist desire of restoring the here and nowness of performance. I cannot give definite answers to those questions, but suffice it to say at the moment that at least in Ikigami's case, technology has a distinctively new location in the creation of dance and dance space. And I would argue that at least has to be remembered and discussed in some time to come. Thank you very much.